I'd like to address a few things you claim about the genealogy of Yeshua. First of all, you are right about many of your conclusions. Let me explain. For example, apologists often use ridiculous arguments to defend the truth. Rather than using ridiculous arguments, I will use sound and logical arguments. First of all, the claim that one genealogy is through Mary and the other is through Joseph is unfounded. Both Luke and Matthew explicitly mention Joseph as through whom Yeshua's genealogy is being traced. And besides, it was never traced through a woman in biblical times. That was simply unheard of. In addition, Mary is indeed from the tribe of Levi. However, this is irrelevant because all we need to know is that Yeshua's genealogy is from Joseph, and that can be demonstrated clearly from the biblical text. At any rate, let me continue. Matthew does not contradict Luke, and Matthew most certainly does not contradict 1 Chronicles. Rather, 1 Chronicles and Luke traces the genealogy of David through Solomon, whereas Matthew traces it through Nathan. Now, about this issue that you do not seem to understand is that people father children at different ages. Some as young as 15, and some much older than that, even past the age of 40. So let's just say, for example, that person A has a child at age 40, and person B has a child at age 40 as well. And finally, person C has a child at age 40. Now, add that up together, and what do you get? You get three generations over the time span of 120 years. Now, let's say those three generations were through Matthew. Now, let's trace through Luke. We have person one have a child at age 15, person two at age 15, person three at age 15, and the same happens with person four, five, six, seven, and eight. 15 multiplied by 8 equals 120 years. So in the same time span of 120 years, you can have three generations and you can have eight generations. Matthew does indeed claim to be including every son in the genealogy. He is not skipping any generations, but is simply tracing the genealogy through Nathan, of which Nathan's descendants fathered the next child in the genealogy at a much older age, averagely. So you can see how 14 generations could be as little as six generations when you trace it through someone else's genealogy. And 14 generations could also be expanded to over 30 generations when you trace it through someone else's genealogy. Now the final thing to discuss is the issue of Joseph having two fathers. Let me tell you this. Joseph did indeed have two fathers. There was something in the Old Testament called Leverit marriage. You can read about it in the, story, in the book of Genesis with the story of Judah and Tamar. But mainly, you can find out about it in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 25, verses 5 through 10. And to explain for you, basically, the Leverit marriage is when a man marries a woman, but the man dies without having any children to continue his bloodline. If the man had a brother, the brother would marry his dead brother's wife, and the children that they had together would continue the dead brother's bloodline. In other words, the child they had together would be considered the heir of a dead brother. However, it would also be considered the son of the living brother who is currently married to the wife of the dead brother. It is in this way that Joseph had two fathers, one biological father and one legal father. But, however, both were considered his father, and so the genealogy could authentically be traced through two different people as Joseph's father. Hello, this is Anaya. This is the first in a series of videos in which I will defend the truth by solving paradoxes. It is my contention that there are no paradoxes that can't be solved. A paradox is something that appears to be a contradiction, even though it is not a contradiction. We may not know how a paradox can be solved, but it can always be solved. This is my argument, and secondly, if absolute truth and logic exist, then there can be no paradoxes. If you see a flaw in any of these videos I make about paradoxes, feel free to post a comment and I will certainly debate with you about that. Thank you. Hello, this is Anaya. In this video, I solved the liar paradox. Just a special side note, the rule that I discover in this video can be shown to apply in many of the other paradoxes. Okay. So the liar paradox goes like this. It strives to ask a true-false question, and, in actuality, everything is either true or false. I agree with this premise. I believe that all things are either true or false. So, 
The liar paradox asks the following. Is the following statement true or false? This statement is false. This paradox is intended to create a contradiction and an endless loop. In mathematical equation, it would be phrased as such, x equals not x. Can x not equal itself? The answer to the liar paradox is false. How can it be false without creating a contradiction? Let me ask you what words are. What are words? Well, words on their own right have no meaning. In order for words to have meaning, there must be a mind that assigns it its own unique meaning. Thus, we need to ask ourselves, what is this question asking? And the answer is, the question is written with the words, this sentence is false. But what the sentence means, and what the sentence is asking us, is the following sentence true or false. This, sen this sentence is both false and true. This is what the statement, this statement is false, means. It is classic reductionism versus holism, and this is holistic. So the answer is false because the meaning of the sentence is false. And the meaning is asking us if the sentence can both be true and false. And the answer is no, it cannot be both true and false. Hello, this is Anaya. This is the beginning of a series of videos in which I will defend so-called heresies. It is my contention that many true beliefs have been labeled as heresies, and the truth has been suppressed for far too long. I am devoted to restoring all the true teachings of God, even the ones labeled as heresies. First of all, for those of the true faith who are worried that I may be a false teacher, let me say in this introduction what my foundational beliefs are that will enable you to be more easy about these series of videos. Often, when people start saying that they believe in heresies, that could be anything. So I just want to put to rest any uncertainties viewers may have as to exactly how far off my beliefs might be. I believe that there are humans who are sinners. Humans who are sinners are in condemnation unless God atones for them. Only God has the power, the ability, to atone for sinners. There is only one God. Jesus is God. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus became a man in order to save sinners from their sins. Jesus' life was a sufficient atonement for all those before and after Jesus who have accepted the atonement by true repentance. You must choose to repent before your time is over. If you don't repent, you will spend eternity in hell, the severity of punishment contingent on how wicked the condemned person was in their unrepentant lives. God, over the many thousands of years, has sent prophets to preach the truth to the world. These prophets spoke the very inerrant word of God. Every book that is scripture is 100% trustworthy and reliable. I believe that every book the Protestants believe is scripture is indeed scripture. I believe in the bodily resurrection of both the wicked and the righteous at the day of judgment. I believe in eternal life for those who have repented of their sins. I believe that no one other than God should be worshipped. Angels are created beings. Creation is not evil. We have free will and are responsible for our choices. Angels are here to help serve humans and further glorify God. Humans were created in the image of God. God is the creator uncreated. Okay, so this is a basic introduction to my beliefs. With this introduction, you can know what I do believe. You can, as a fellow believer, know that my foundation is reliable and trustworthy. Stay tuned for the heresies that I will be defending. These heresies will mesh perfectly and support wholeheartedly the things that I mentioned in this video that I believe. Thank you for watching this video, and God bless you. Feel free to comment on this or any of the future videos in this series. Hello, this is Anaya. I am making this video in order to defend the concept of hell. For God, there is a huge problem he has. What is he to do with the wicked? He ultimately has three choices. Universal reconciliation, annihilationism, 
or eternal damnation. I believe that there are severe problems with universal reconciliation and annihilationism, so severe that they could not in good conscience be held to. I will discuss the different aspects of each. Universal salvation makes a mockery out of free will. It essentially forces people to be with God forever, even though they chose to reject Him. And what is the purpose of this life on earth? What could justify all this horrible pain and suffering if it was for nothing? Universal salvation cannot sufficiently give a good answer to the problem of evil. It also makes a mockery out of righteous living. Why should anyone repent and live a righteous life if they are going to be saved anyways? It doesn't make any sense. All the warnings and commands to repent are meaningless unless their repenting enables someone to avoid a terrible fate. Universal salvation also suggests even Lucifer will be saved. But in order for this to happen, he would have to force Lucifer to be saved. Others have suggested that a person is tormented in hell until they repent. This creates the potential for eternal damnation and doesn't solve the alleged problem with hell. In short, universal salvation is not biblically accurate, nor is it just. Perfect justice requires God to punish everyone who has rejected him. God is not a God of injustice. God is perfectly just and will give to each one what he has chosen for himself. Either life eternal by choosing God or eternal dam damnation by rejecting God. Next, we shall discuss annihilationism. Annihilationism has a major problem, this being the eternality of the soul. God has created each and every soul as an eternal soul. How dare we say that anything God creates can be annihilated? Anything God creates will last forever in some form. Annihilationism is disrespectful to his creation. All souls are purposed to live forever. This is their design. To annihilate would be to desecrate this purpose. It would be disrespectful to the souls of the wicked. It would be unjust and unfair to annihilate souls that are eternal in nature. The injustice of annihilationism is most clearly demonstrated by seeing the punishment of Hitler versus a relatively good sinner. Annihilationism does away with being judged for all of one action, one's actions. If a person is wicked, it doesn't matter how wicked they are, they will get the same fate as the next person who is wicked. That is unfair, unjust, and repugnant. Annihilationism would remove the true meaning of sin. Sin would lose all meaning as each additional sin adds nothing to the person's fate. And yet we see in scripture that each person is to be judged according to what they have done. And Jesus said that some will, will receive great punishment while others will receive less. How can that be if annihilationism is true? We can therefore rule out scripturally and logically that annihilationism is true. This leaves us with the last of options, eternal damnation. Often it is suggested that eternal damnation is cruel because of its infinite nature. They wonder, how can a person be judged infinitely for a sin committed finitely? Well, I ask you, what do you do with murder? Murderers do not go to jail for simply two minutes. They will get put in jail for life more often than not. And that is a really long time compared to the short amount of time the murder was committed in. We have to realize that sin's effects are infinite in nature. Every sin we commit offends God in an infinite way. And furthermore, the person has chosen to reject God. The rejection requires that they live a life apart from God's mercy as they have rejected it. Judgment, or in other words, withholding of God's mercy must last as long as the person has chosen to reject God. And the wicked have chosen to reject God for eternity by refusing to repent. Therefore, the infinite length of their punishment is just and deserved, as they must feel for eternity what the wicked consequences of their sins that they have chosen to accept are. It will ever be before them by their own choice, and God is honoring their choice by giving them their punishment. As scripture says, the wages of sin is death. Many others still try to claim that eternal damnation is cruel and unusual punishment. I respond in this way. The major difference between cruel and, and unusual punishment is how and why it is being done. Eternal damnation is not sadistic. 
God does not take pleasure in the pain and suffering of his creatures that he loves. But he does take seriously sin and righteousness, and he respects evil enough to respond to it in the proper and just way. God does not enjoy the punishments of hell. He wishes all of us not to go to hell. Just as a righteous judge does not want anyone to murder, but if someone does murder, he is a good and righteous and just judge and will punish that murderer right, that murderer rightly, even though he really did not want that murderer to go through the punishment in the first place. He wanted the murderer to not murder. That's how God views hell. He does not wish anyone will go there, but will send people there if they commit the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is simply refusing to repent. In other words, everyone who refuses to repent rightly deserves and will go to hell for eternity. Further, hell is not cruel and, un and unusual punishment because it is not being done indiscriminately and it is being done in proper response to a crime. It is not like torture in war because that kind of torture is not punishment. Torture in war has nothing to do with punishment. It has no limits and disrespects and degrades the person. It tramples all over their rights and causes unnecessary and uncalled for pain and suffering. And in hell, new bodies will be received. The old bodies on earth were easily destroyed. In hell, these bodies will be really strong and will never die. Thus, the body pains in hell will be much different than the body pains on earth. Often it is asked, what is the purpose of hell? Many try to make it into a restorative justice, as if that is the only acceptable kind of justice. But that is not the world we live in, nor is it a world that would be good to live in. Restorative justice has no limits to the kind of pain and suffering that can be inflicted. This is potentially eternal, and thus does not solve the perceived unfairness of eternal punishment in hell. Retributive justice, on the other hand, is much more respectful and righteous. Retributive justice takes seriously the actions one commits, and the rightful consequences of these actions are for the person to be punished solely because they deserve to be punished. We see this consistently throughout the Law of Moses, or the Torah. All the death penalties were final, and had nothing restorative about them at all. The Torah was all about retrib retributive justice. This is considered to be a good thing, according to most people, when the government does retributive justice, so if Retributive justice can be a good thing, then there is no problem for hell to be retributive justice. As God says, vengeance belongs to him. We ought to forgive those who sin against us and seek repentance for our past sins before it is too late. Further proofs that the Bible teaches retributive justice can be found with the flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, and the end times destruction known as the time of Jacob's trouble. With all this taken into account, and further with the warnings of the prophets and Jesus the Messiah himself. If we do not repent, we will not be saved, and the fate we shall receive will be really painful and ultimately not worth it. I hope this video has shown you that eternal damnation in hell is biblical, and that it, it, it is called for in order for true justice to be given to eternal souls. In my next video, I will be describing to you what hell is going to be like. Stay tuned. Hello, this is Anaya. I thought it would be an interesting topic to post on what the end time deception will be. I am about to read from the Revelation of John, chapter 20. In this chapter, it starts off by saying the following three verses. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil, or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss, and locked and sealed it over him, to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until, he, t until the thousand years were ended. And after that, he must be set free for a short time. So, as you can see in this passage, Satan is prevented from deceiving the nations any longer during the Millennial Kingdom. However, there is one small catch. At the end of the Millennial Kingdom, Satan must be released, and being released, he will deceive one last time the nations. I continue reading from chapter 20, in verses 7 to 10. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison, and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. In number they are like the sand on the seashore, 
They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, a city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil, who deceived them, was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. I have read this passage many, many times. And each time I read it, it greatly saddens me and grieves my spirit. Even when they have Messiah living with them for 1,000 years, and it is undeniable that he is Yahuwah, they will still find a way to rebel against Yahuwah. And notice the passage says their number is like the sands of the seashore. The number of individuals who will be deceived by this one last deception will be enormous. This is what greatly saddens me. And I began thinking to myself, what kind of deception could this possibly be that John is prophesying about? I began thinking and contemplating this a lot. And then it hit me. I finally realized that what the deception is going to be. And this revelation makes it even more sad and tragic. Essentially, the story of mankind ends in a very sad but poetic way. I believe the deception will go a little something like this from the mouth of a seemingly innocent character. Okay, so here goes. There is a certain tree during the Millennial Kingdom. This tree is the largest of all trees and steals energy from the other trees in order to survive. This particular tree bears a very precious fruit. This tree is called the Knowledge of Good and Evil, and once again, Yahuwah has told his people not to eat from the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil. And Satan will return to Earth and see some humans and ask them about that tree. Satan will open his mouth and say, Did Yahuwah really say you must not eat from any tree on Earth? But the people will respond and say to Satan, We may eat from the trees of the world, but Yahuwah did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the Earth and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, Satan replied, for Yahuwah knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like Yahuwah, knowing good and evil. When people saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, they took some and ate it. They also gave some to their friends and families, and they ate it. Okay. So in other words, I believe that the very last deception will be the same as the first deception that was made against humans. Essentially, Satan will tell them that they can be like Yahuwah, that humans can make their own rules and do whatever they want. They can sin and not die. They can sin without there being any consequences. This, I believe, will be the very last deception, the, the deception that was the first one. This is very poetic, but in a sad and tragic way. But it makes sense, and it would seem to fit with the descriptions of Satan, how he never changes his wicked ways, and the descriptions found in the Revelation of John. Anyways, this is more of a theory of mine, not something I am adamant on. Thus, if any of you have other ideas as to what the deception might be, I would love to hear it. It is certainly an interesting thing to discuss. Thank you. Shalom.